Gaza Strip is only 25 miles long and about five miles wide. Two million Palestinians live packed into this tiny space, one of the most densely populated places in the world. Half are children. Many live in refugee camps speckled throughout the besieged territory. A stunning 80% of the population relies on foreign aid. Aptly called an open-air prison, there are only two ways to leave the enclosed area. The Rez crossing into Israeli territory and the Rafah crossing, which goes to Egypt. Both are completely controlled by hostile militaries. What Israel calls a border is actually a heavily militarized perimeter fence comprised of barbed wire, surveillance networks, and lethal no-go zones. If you roam too close to the so-called no-go zone, which extends 300 meters out from the fence, Israeli forces have authorized themselves to shoot to kill. Thousands of unarmed Palestinians have been shot for violating this rule in 2018 alone. The same goes for Gaza's coastline. It is the only place in the world where you can't even flee by boat, as refugees elsewhere often do. Fishermen are restricted to only a few nautical miles from their shore. Strain past that, even by accident, you can be blown out of the water by Israeli warships. A massive seawall on the north and south, currently being extended, boxes them into their small sliver of sea. This video is kind of spontaneous, so right now I don't know what it's going to look like, but it is going to cover the situation in Palestine and the situation with regards to Genspect, Stella O'Malley, and Posey Parker. Since the last time I made a video, uh, October 7th happened, and then obviously the invasion and genocide of Gaza preceded that. So I'm obviously pro-Palestinian, but the purpose of this video isn't a kind of, you know, justification or introduction to the Palestinian liberation movement. But there were a few things that I noticed. So the first one was, uh, I didn't know Posey Parker was a Zionist, and I thought I should make a proper video response to her videos, uh, but I thought her initial comments in the wake of the attack on the 7th were just, you know, like dumb, <laughs> um, obviously just accepting war propaganda on face value, accepting things totally on face value. And my justification or my kind of explanation for that was that she wasn't really paying attention to the issue that much. But now that I've seen how widespread Zionism is throughout the gender critical movement, it's actually like way bigger a way bigger contingent, I think, than either the left or the right of gender critical, because um, J.K. Rowling, from what I understand, is a Zionist. I have a feeling she's maybe even married to someone who has some kind of political connection to Israel. So Posey Parker, Julie Bindle, a bunch of prominent Australian gender critical people are also Zionists, um, fucking... Graham Linehan, <laughs> uh, even Karen Davis, who I don't think is not connected to the same people, obviously. She's come to that opinion of her own, and that's fine. But I'm just talking about how, how basically it's me and King Critical, from what I can see, people who have channels who are, like, commenting on both. And obviously I could see a reason why. It's a very similar issue in that people will stop talking to you. Um, there's a... It's... I think the parallels between Zionism and trans are very strong. I've made a video about this previously, but I kind of opened um, this up to collective input, I guess, and was using the hashtag Israel's dead name is Palestine. And uh, we started to create a list of all the ways that Zionism and gender identity ideology overlap. and. Like, fundamentally, they're going to overlap because they're both forms of colonization. So 
the same way that there are a lot of similarities between how North America was colonized and how Australia was colonized because they're both colonization, it works here too. So I guess I'll just read through them. <laughs> My apologies if this is a bit all over the place. One, Zionists and gender identity ideologues renamed everything and took away the language. So yeah, in Israel, the same way that they did in Australia and America, they renamed the indigenous places. The same way front hole is a renaming of uh, women's body parts. Two, the idea that they, the colonizers, weren't stealing anything in the first place because sex is a spectrum. Israel makes the same claim about Palestine being, quote, a land with no people for a people with no land effectively arguing that women and Palestinians aren't coherent groups from which something can be stolen. Three, concern regarding the right to exist, which seems to only be a concern when one's existence is based on a social construct and not objective conditions. On the other hand, women always will be, Aboriginal land always will be, and especially while the refugees from 1948 are waiting to return, always will be Palestine. The same way trans is a base from which capital can operate in an otherwise hostile arena, homosexuals, Israel is a base from which the US can operate in the Middle East, where it has been clearly and sometimes openly genocidal for decades. 5. A New York-born and bred Jew having Holy Land feels can displace an Arab born in Jerusalem because of self-proclaimed specialness, just like a trans-identifying male is apparently even more a woman than these cis women running around claiming rights to women's spaces. 6. The Davo. I invaded your land and you objected and were mean to me, so you're the abuser. 7. The incessant gaslighting and repeating of untrue slogans until people have heard them so often they think they must be true. Quote, Arafat was offered 90% of his demands, or J.K. Rowling has said lots of transphobic things. 8. Any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic in the way any criticism of transgenderism is transphobic. 8b. Saying from the river to the sea is racist in the same way saying women have vaginas is transphobic. From the river to the sea. Yes, that's where Palestine is. Sorry you don't have one. 9. Claiming the status of an oppressed minority when you're actually a privileged group. Middle class white men with fetishes are not an oppressed minority. Israel, a rich state armed to the teeth by a superpower, is not a vulnerable group vis-a-vis -vis the people they are oppressing. 10. Otherwise sensible people abandon rational thought when the words Israel or trans women come up. Suddenly, there is no debate and you are the devil if you try to have one. Hard to say why this happens, but it could be because they have a friend or relative who is trans or Zionist. 11. Narcissism. That's it. That's number 11. 12. 12 is a skit called Be Kind that is very funny, but it's easier understood when read, like when read off the page as opposed to when read aloud. Uh, so I'm just going to skip that one, uh, but you should check it out. 13. Flattening Gaza is gender affirmation for Israel. It's high tech, ugly, unethical, it disproportionately hurts women and children, and it will ultimately hurt the people who they are ostensibly trying to help. 13b. This child, permanently damaged by trauma. What is the crime that the child did for him to live that way? There's no crime for him, just for being a Palestinian. is Israel's equivalent of a botched SRS surgery. The same way surgeons on TikTok will do completely reckless things, which you must eventually conclude are being done intentionally, and their explanation will be, oops, we need to do another surgery. 
Israel will drop a nuclear bomb worth of explosives onto a city that is comprised of two-thirds women and children, and then pretend that results like this are an accident, or that they had no choice but to do this in order to save lives, and of course, the best way we can make things better is to pay them to do it again. 14. Law of return is akin to self-ID, in that both processes accept rapid onset conversions in the wake of child sexual abuse allegations, which assist abusers in evading police. A CBS News investigation has uncovered a loophole that allows accused and convicted American pedophiles to escape justice by moving to Israel. So Ian Lee has been following this for more than a year and he traveled to Israel for this investigation. He worked with a group that tracks people accused of sex crimes, which estimates dozens of Americans have used this loophole. 15. This is the testimony of a trans widow with the word man replaced with Israel. I could see that Israel was suffering, but I realize now it was suffering just because it couldn't have its way in all things at all times. What's Israel's was Israel's, and what's mine was Israel's. Israel was suffering because it couldn't have its way and the world wouldn't bend to its will. And that was terribly hard for Israel. I knew pretty quickly that I had to get out of there, but I didn't know anybody and Israel found ways to isolate me. So it was pretty terrifying. Israel was relentless. I would stay in the room with the kids for ages, but there was no bathroom. So eventually, I would have to go out to the bathroom, and Israel would always be out there waiting. Another parallel that I just wanted to add now is that both groups of oppressors find it terribly entertaining to dress up as the oppressed group. So, obviously, I see a very strong connection between uh, trans and Israel. The other thing is that Israel sells its, like, defends itself on the basis that it's pro-trans, and... Uh, does the kind of like, oh, you're gay and you think like um, Palestinians shouldn't be genocided, <laughs> but they would want to kill you, which is something the Israelis have worked on for decades by funding Hamas in order to uh, destabilize Palestine and um, unseat the PLO, which was a secular left wing organization. <laughs> The Palestinian militant group Hamas has carried out brutal acts of terror against Israeli civilians. And Israeli and American leaders are always keen to tell us how dangerous and evil Hamas is. The inhumanity of Hamas. I have no sympathy for Hamas. That keep shelling Israel with thousands of uh, rockets and uh, mortar shells. But what if I told you that Israel helped create Hamas? Officially, Hamas, which is the acronym for an Arabic phrase meaning Islamic resistance movement, was founded in 1987, at the start of the first Palestinian Intifada, or uprising, against the Israeli occupation. But its roots were planted much earlier. The Hamas founder, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, was a half-blind, disabled Palestinian cleric and member of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Brotherhood had been repressed by the Egyptians in Gaza prior to 1967. But once the Israelis invaded and occupied the Strip, they didn't just turn a blind eye to these Islamists, they encouraged them. See, the Israelis, especially right-wing Israelis, wanted to undermine the power of the dominant Palestinian political force at that time, the nationalist PLO, at the heart of which was the secular Fatah party of Yasser Arafat, their bete noire. <laughs> By empowering Sheikh Yassin and the Muslim Brotherhood, Israeli leaders thought they could divide and rule the occupied Palestinians, play them off against each other, secular nationalists against religious Islamists. So in 1978, when Yassin wanted to officially register his Islamic association, which was basically the precursor to Hamas, the Israelis were only too keen to help. Yassin built and grew a network of Islamist social institutions across Gaza, including schools and clubs and mosques, and Israel helped fund some of those projects. Most American politicians have no clue about any of this, although the former Republican Congressman Ron Paul once made this point on the floor of the House. Hamas was encouraged and really started by Israel because they wanted Hamas to counteract Yasser Arafat. Arafat himself told an Italian newspaper, quote, Hamas is a creature of Israel. 
He even claimed that former Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin admitted as much to him, calling it a fatal error. Now, you might be wondering, why should I believe mad Ron Paul or the famously shady Yasser Arafat? Well, you don't have to. You can believe top Israeli and US officials who've basically owned up to all this. Brigadier Yitzhak Segev, for example, who was the Israeli military governor in Gaza and later told a New York Times reporter that he helped finance the Islamic movement. The Israeli government gave me a budget, he said, and the military government gives to the mosques. Colonel David Hakam, who worked in Gaza in the late 1980s as an Arab affairs expert in the Israeli military, has admitted that the original sin was Israeli support for Yassin in the late 70s. But at the time, he has argued, nobody thought about the possible results. Well, Avner Cohen did. Cohen was the Israeli official who was responsible for religious affairs in Gaza for more than two decades, and who now says, quote, Hamas, to my great regret, is Israel's creation. Yeah. Cohen's words. He actually wrote an official report to his superiors in the mid-1980s, warning them not to play divide and rule in the occupied territories and calling on Israel to, quote, break up this monster before this reality jumps in our face. But no one else on the Israeli side really took the possibility of blowback seriously at that time. They never do, do they? Hamas has since killed far more Israeli civilians than any secular Palestinian militant group, and its leaders have been pretty viciously anti-Israeli and even anti-Semitic in their rhetoric. <laughs> Sheikh Yassin would eventually be assassinated by an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. Sheikh Yassin and its organization, the Hamas, are responsible to the killings of more than 400 Israelis. So the question shouldn't be, why now? I think it should be, why not before? Why not before? Well, because before, Israel was actually nudging and winking at Yassin and co, building them up as a rival to Arafat's Fatah. The die was cast for blowback. Blowback, incidentally, that they decided to double down on when they assassinated Yassin. You can hear the crowds chanting for Hamas, and any idea that this operation would actually suppress or diminish that organization seems to be ill-judged. The inconvenient truth is that Hamas is in part a creature of Israel's own making, an enemy that Israel spent more than 20 years helping to build up and then spent the next 20 years, the past 20 years that is, trying to bomb, besiege, and blockade out of existence. The three Gaza wars fought by Israel against Hamas since 2008 killed around 2,000 Palestinian civilians and a dozen Israeli civilians. That's the real human cost of blowback. David Long, a former Middle East expert at the US State Department under Ronald Reagan, told journalist Robert Dreyfus, I thought the Israelis were playing with fire. I didn't realize they'd end up creating a monster. But I don't think you ought to mess around with potential fanatics. It's a lesson both the Israelis and the Americans never seem to learn, though. And as usual, innocent people, in this case Palestinians and Israelis, continue to lose their lives. So yeah, I'm not necessarily here to try and uh, convince people to change their minds re this issue. I'll probably do that in, at other points. But I more just wanted to bring it up to say this is something I've noticed. Um, has anyone else noticed this too? There are a handful of other GC Palestine supporters. The main people I'm aware of who are both gender critical and support Palestine is the Red Femme podcast. I haven't actually listened to any of their Palestine content, but that's just the <laughs> vibe I got. Um, oh, Exelanzic, another Zionist. So there's basically no one. So I've also, I've had two interactions with Posey Parker on Twitter regarding this. And in my opinion, which is obviously biased, I think she lost both encounters and I will invite you to judge the situation for yourself. So there's an undercover video recording of someone who works for Raytheon uh, who, that provides weapons to Israel and the interviewer asks him if he's comfortable with how many children are being killed and the employee basically says, uh, what is it, Ruben Armas, basically says, I just have to like, like log off mentally and completely compartmentalize that part of my life. Uh, but actually, 
This was the second one. Let's go back to the first one. Yeah, here we go. So the Posey Parker says, there's a clear link between rape apologism, anti-Semitism, and pretending women don't have penises. The Venn diagram is almost a circle. Underneath that comment is a photograph of a Lush store and it has Boycott Israel, which is obviously part of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which has been going for a decade, maybe more. And it's a completely nonviolent boycott movement, the same that was organized against South Africa. But I've never met a nice South African. Now he's never met a nice South African. And it's not bloody surprising, man, because we're the bunch of arrogant forces who hate black people. I thought it was completely unfair for Kelly J to insinuate that participation in a non-violent boycott against what you perceive to be an apartheid state, whether you're right or not, is not rape apologism or anti-Semitism. So I said to her, I thought you didn't do guilt by association. How is grouping the explicitly non-violent Israeli boycott movement with Hamas terrorists because they are, quote, on the same side, not exactly the same tactic as grouping let women speak and Nazis? To which she replies, timing, which isn't a rebuttal, it's a, like, further definition of the basis for the guilt by association. Anyway, my comment was, would this mean that displaying a Let Women Speak banner in the days after a massacre targeted at trans people would be the equivalent of endorsing the massacre? Using timing as the basis of the association is still guilt by association. To which she said nothing. So then we get to our second conversation or back and forth, whatever you want to call it. So, as I said, this video is a Raytheon employee. The interviewer asked, doesn't it freak you out how many kids Israel kills? And the employee basically said, I just have to log off and not think about it. So I work for Raytheon. Oh, okay. So a lot of the stuff that I do, I can't really talk about it. But, oh, you can't talk about it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's basically all I can really say. Yeah. So yeah. I have to take a lie detector test every year. Oh, wow. Yeah, because I work on it. So my program that I work on is classified. Yeah. yeah. You make weapons, right? Yeah. Okay. And then they are used in a war. Yeah. I support Israel. You support Israel? Even if, like, children are dying. That's, like, a gray area. There's no right answer for it, to be honest. Everything I do is in the gray area, so... I yeah. accepted that. Like the Gaza Strip, like a lot of them are children. Yeah. Like what, 50% or something? Probably more. Probably more. And it's yeah, whatever I do, the minute I walk out the door, it's gone. I forget all, all of it. Okay. Yeah. Even if it's children. Even if it's children. Oh my gosh. Because I know some people that, that do jobs that are hurting people. Yes. It will like haunt them, you know? Yeah. I leave I my job at the door. I have to. Yeah. Otherwise, they'll, lock, uh, otherwise they'll haunt me for... So you never... And their friends would hesitate because they didn't want to shoot kids and then they would die. Yeah. They just couldn't do it. Yeah. Like you feel conflicted at your decisions sometimes? Um... I don't feel conflicted with what I do. I know it's a necessary evil at times, but... Yeah, exactly. And completely compartmentalize that section of my life. To which Kelly J. Keene says, He makes weapons. Weapons kill people, including children. All people in the munitions industry are complicit in killing. Killing all children in war. Same as those who sell weapons to Hamas. To which I said, except for the fact that the IDF disproportionately kills children in a way that is incomparable to any modern conflict and not even Hamas comes close to competing with. 
And to illustrate these points, I showed this chart, which was done, I'm not sure how long into the invasion of Gaza, but it basically shows in a very short time, the invasion of Gaza killed many, many, many more times the people that were killed on October 7th. Not only that, but it kill, it disproportionately killed children. And when you look at the people who died on October 7th, they were clustered between above the ages of 18 and below the ages of 25, indicating that civilians weren't randomly targeted. I then included this classic graphic from a uh, shirt that's popular with the IDF. Uh, so this is another inserted randomly bit. So when this first blew up, Kelly J. Keene was talking about her response and and someone said to her something to the effect of, you know, this is war propaganda, you can't necessarily judge it on face value. And her response was like, well, we're all mature enough to be able to judge things on face value. As though, as though the knocking over the baby is an incubator story <laughs> and so many other countless pieces of like later disproven war propaganda weren't widely accepted by the public when they were first told about them. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, a national day of mourning has been declared following the death of former President George H.W. Bush, who died Friday at the age of 94. The post office and other federal agencies are closed for the day. A funeral service for Bush is being held today at the Washington National Cathedral. Former presidents Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter and Bush's son, George W. Bush, will attend, as will President Trump, who was not invited to speak. Former Florida Governor Jeb Bush explained why President Trump was not speaking by saying, quote, it's because we have a unique circumstance here. My brother was president, first dibs, as we used to say. Uh, a second funeral will be held on Thursday in Houston, where jo uh, George H.W. Bush will be buried. Uh, well, we continue now to look back at the legacy of the 41st president. Bush only served one term uh, in the Oval Office, but the blowback from his 1991 invasion of Iraq is still being felt today. Although the Gulf War technically ended in February 1991, the U.S. war on Iraq would continue for decades, first in the form of devastating sanctions and then in the 2003 invasion launched by uh, George H.W. Bush's son, uh, George W. Bush. Thousands of U.S. troops and contractors remain in Iraq today. We look back now at a largely forgotten aspect of Bush's war in Iraq, the vast domestic propaganda campaign that occurred in the United States before the invasion began. The story centers on a young Kuwaiti woman named Nayira. On October 10, 1990, the 15-year-old girl gave riveting testimony before Congress about the horrors inside Kuwait after Iraq invaded. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Nayira, and I just came out of Kuwait. My sister, with my five-day-old nephew, traveled across the desert to safety. There was no milk available for the baby in Kuwait. They barely escaped when their car was stuck in the desert, desert sand, and help came from Saudi Arabia. I stayed behind and wanted to do something for my country. The second week after an invasion, I volunteered, volunteered at the al Adan Hospital with 12 other women who wanted to help as well. I was the youngest volunteer. The other women were from 20 to 30 years old. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. It was horrifying. I could not help but think of my nephew. Nayira's testimony was rebroadcast across the country and marked a turning point in public opinion on going to war. President George H.W. Bush repeatedly cited her claims. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. Three months after Nayira testified, President George H.W. Bush launched the invasion of Iraq. But it turned out Nayira's claims weren't true. 
No human rights group or news outlet could confirm what she said. It also turned out Nayira was not just any Kuwaiti teenager. She was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States, Saad Nasir al-Sabah. She had been coached by the public relations firm Hill & Knowlton, which was working for the Kuwaiti government. We're joined now by the journalists who first revealed Nayira's identity. Rick MacArthur, the president and publisher of Harper's Magazine, the author of the book Second Front, Censorship and Propaganda in the 1991 Gulf War. They took the babies out of the incubators. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I can't go on. <laughs> That's okay. Your tears say more than real evidence ever could. Added to which, like, you're definitely not checking both sides to make sure that you get a fair opinion, because one of the most glaring things ways that this is revealed is the fact that the uprising in Gaza was in response to an insane, insane brutality against women worshippers inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque, one of the holiest places in all of Islam. So let's just have a look at this footage. Yeah. And while we're watching this footage, do we remember any of the GCs being, oh, my fellow women, being, being violently abused by men? Or did this event, which must have been one of the most impactful events in the Muslim world when it happened, somehow completely escaped everybody's analysis? Like, I have not seen a gender-critical woman being treated worse than how these Israeli soldiers are treating these female worshippers. Ya Allah! Ya Allah! Ya Allah! Ya and most importantly, this graphic, which shows that in 30 days, the Israeli military has killed more children than have been killed in other conflicts over a period of decades. Here's the thing, I shouldn't be able to win an argument, an engagement with <laughs> Posey Barker on something like this. And I've said this previously that like part of the reason why it's the attraction to me to trans is a way to just be right about stuff with a lot of people who uh, have a misconception about reality. And I think that Israel works in a very similar way. And so in the same way that a not very intelligent person could win an argument about gender identity with a very educated person because it's fundamentally stupid. I think a similar thing happens with Zionism. And I would submit these two dialogues with Kelly J as evidence. And I would say, um, we would all say that in a lot of ways, JK Rowling, you know, is a, is, a, is a thing that the movement absolutely depends on. And the fact that there isn't a pro-Palestinian equivalent means that the movement is disproportionately Zionist. And that's, that is a, that's an issue, I believe, <laughs> because the opposition to Israel is a mass movement at the moment, the likes of which kind of hasn't been seen for a while, which might seem like I think a lot of people are going to go like, yeah, like Black Lives Matter and trans and all this other f like stuff that isn't real or is a psyop of some description. But the thing with Palestine is Palestine's older than all that. Palestine's when people are like, I'm an old school lefty or I'm, yeah, I'm from the left before it got woke. What I'm, I guess, suggesting is that this isn't another Black Lives Matter. This is another anti-war movement of 2003 that tried to stop the invasion of Iraq. That was a massive blow up too. And that, um, you know, like the right wing uh, was against that. Um, like Team America World Police was Matt and Trey's like attempt to, all, like all the stereotypes about anti-war people being like stupid and fags. <laughs> like, um, yeah, it's all there. What I'm saying is there's a huge mass movement that, that makes a lot of sense. And I don't think it's like, oh, gender critical people should get on board with Palestine because Palestine needs the help. All over the planet are turning against Israel. An Israeli think tank today that has been tracking protests around the world gave some figures for what it looked like between October 7th and October 13th in terms of the number of uh, 
protests around the world that were pro-Israel versus pro-Palestine. And then it looked at the numbers from uh, October 13th up to the present. 69% were pro-Palestinian in the first six days after October 7th, 69%. 31% were pro-Israel. Since October 13th, if you look at the number of protests around the world, 95% have been pro-Palestinian and 5% have been pro-Israel. The public opinion around the world has shifted against Israel. And if you look at some of the demonstrations in places like London and Washington, D.C., it's truly amazing the number of people who are coming out in support of the Palestinians. To support my point, that it was just not smart for Israel to uh, launch this bombing campaign, right? You can make an argument for going after Hamas and doing it in a surgical way or as surgical a way as possible, uh, but uh, that's not what they did. <laughs> I think if pro-Palestinian gender critical people don't make it aware that there is that kind of thing, that that opinion exists, then it will alienate us from a huge bunch of people that we don't need to be alienated from on that issue. Because that's the whole point of a single issue organizing is it's supposed to be single issue. But if it's only single issue, so long as we all tacitly accept Zionism, <laughs> then that's actually a, a two issue movement. And I wonder how many people would be like, you know, the same way um, Kelly J is always saying, what do you value? Do you value women? Or do you value this other thing? The amount of Zionists who would go, fuck you, women can burn if I don't get Israel, would be, I think, as high, if not higher, than the people who are pro-Palestine who have done the same thing and gone like, I can't support you since you won't support Palestine, which I don't think she should do. But I think that, yeah, we are in this weird situation um, where the whole movement seems to be Zionist. And uh, I think um, it doesn't have to be, I hope. <laughs> And there are smart, funny people who, who, are, who are talking about this. I invite everyone to kind of participate. Uh, and very importantly, support, um, support Brittany at Slightly Twisted Female in her, like go subscribe to her because she's lost some subscribers. Not that I think there's anyone who knows me that doesn't know her. But yeah, she's kind of really, she's being really critical of Genspect at the moment. And I think that is important. Um, yeah. Why am, I, why am I suddenly bringing that up at the end of the video? Um, how did I see them as related? Well, yeah, I guess just the ability to challenge Kelly J in a way that is, you know, I didn't see the, like, apparently there was a more offensive video or a more confrontational video. Um, but yeah, I think the way that she's speaking now is reasonable. And yeah, I like the fact that someone is prepared to question, particularly Genspect. Genspect is fucking crazy. I did that video of the eyes wide shut thing ages ago off the back of like Karen Davis's early Genspect work, which was brilliant, her work. Thank you, Mr. Millich. I'll call you soon. Bye-bye. Goodbye, gentlemen. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And you too. Yeah, so they've always been stomach churning. So it has been weird to see Kelly J not really challenge them as much as one would have hoped or yeah, it's I don't know, it, it's totally gotten a bit um Obamary or Trumpy where you just kind of start to read into people and like fill them with what you think they're doing secretly in the 4D chess moves. But yeah, anyway, that's some of my thoughts. I just remembered this, so if you're hearing it, it's been inserted here out of context. And that was to say that the other thing that I remembered was Megan Murphy and how crazy her <laughs> adoption of Zionism was. Because we got to see it, because she was saying she didn't know what Zionism was prior to this whole thing happening. So this was kind of like the last straw. I'm just not watching anymore. So an additional parting shot that I wanted to take was that it fucking bugs me the way that she says I was a Marxist when it's evident she doesn't understand anything about Marxism. And I know that Zionism and Marxism aren't the same thing, but like the fact that she doesn't know what Zionism is does give you an indication of how like deep and involved in socialist circles she was and how much she understood. Like if she didn't even know what the, f 
like hadn't like that is fucking mind boggling. <laughs> so then it's really annoying to have her turn around and go like, oh yeah, well I was a Marxist because I was just jealous of people who were rich and that type of thing. It's like, that's a problem with you. That's not a problem with the ideology you, I doubt you could explain. And so, yeah, she just completely accepted that side which to me is crazy in particular because one of the things that she always used to say during the gender debate when that was more fiery was that I can't get anyone who disagrees with me on the podcast. They just won't come on. And that made sense at the time. But now with this issue, it's like there are definitely people who would go on her podcast to talk about Palestine, but she's not actually interested in that debate. She's not even interested in hearing the other side and that kind of to me shows just such a opposition to what she seemed or what she purported to stand for in terms of not being committed to one particular idea and being open to debate and and that type of thing yeah I just don't think it's true I also wouldn't be surprised if any of these people who have a platform online that they are making money off like if they've got other advertisers or they could have other advertisers based on their size then i don't see any reason why the idf wouldn't have approached them as you've heard like you know podcasters and stuff talk about the idf approaching them to be a kind of propaganda outlet for the idf so it wouldn't surprise me if that's happened within the gender critical movement especially given how absolutely pervasive Zionism is within this movement. Here, Steve, <laughs> Steve Byrne calls me and Steve Byrne goes, you want to go to Israel? I go, why? <laughs> That's my response, right? He goes, it's free. They'll fly you out. You Come on, you didn't do birthright and pretended you were Jewish. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, I didn't do that. No, but he said, um, no, the, the government, Israeli government is flying out like, celebrities for free out there to do a tour for free and it's on the house they fly you first class the whole thing why do you think ziggler invites us to these things every year this is what you get for making house calls wow and i go oh who's going he goes it's gonna be me you george lopez jamie chung brian greenberg her husband i like it. I, I love him I, I love brian right and i go it's free they go yeah it's not free because when you land there, they go, you have to every day tweet positive things about, about Israel. Israel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I just felt so uneasy, uh, uneasy about it. Yeah. But couldn't you just go, what, why do you, because you have, because you have a lot of Palestinian friends. Yeah. I mean, I know some, you know what I mean? I don't know much about it. I just know that they're in conflict and it's just like, but I did, I did what they said, but it's like the fucking wrath I got was insane insane what was some of the stuff you tweeted jews, oh, just, jews good palestinians yeah. bad is that what you tweeted yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> jew number one build the wall higher what, it, like, what, no what? it was just basically you know oh um palestinians i uh, know uh, israel's a beautiful country yeah that's probably true that's true it though. is true but then it's like i had to tag the government in it or whatever <laughs> oh that's crazy the israeli government yeah oh fuck that's weird as shit yeah and it was just like well, every you, day it was just non-stop you were cucking for the israeli government yeah but i wish i hadn't gone really as part of our investigation we spoke to ari ben mashani who is a former israeli spy he said on the record unequivocally that Jeffrey Epstein was working for Israeli intelligence operations, the Mossad, and running a classic honey trap operation. That is, lure people inside, record their uh, uh, activities, and learn about their peccadillos, and use it to blackmail them. The Why do you think Ziggler invites us to these things every year? This is a former spy on the record in the new book, Epstein, Dead Men, Tell No Tales. Interestingly, this person was also the handler of Jeffrey Epstein's best friend and ex-girlfriend, Ghislaine Maxwell. Yeah. <laughs> yes, good job, good fight. Congratulations. Yes, 
Good luck. No. Got it. Bye bye, Shukran. Bye bye. You go home. Bye. Come. I I I I heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Now, what I'm getting does not bother me. <laughs>